Good day, grade 11. Welcome to this next lesson in geometric optics. What we're going to do today is we're going to go through a couple of exam type questions on geometric optics um, on the stuff that we've learned. Then we're going to do some critical angles, learning about critical angles and do some more exam paper questions. And then if we have time, we'll move to 2D and 3D waves and Huygens principle and diffraction. Right, so let's get started. We actually started this last lesson um, but when I say started it we basically drew a red line and that was it and we wrote n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2 and we never got further than that so what we're going to do in this lesson is obviously go through this question um, and there is a reason we didn't get any further I just realized it's because we needed to learn about the critical angle. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to not go through this question until I've taught you the critical angle question. I remember now that why I did this, not do this question. Okay, so let's teach you about the critical angle. It's actually really easy. The critical angle is the angle of incidence where the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. In other words, if you've got some angle that goes, okay, first of all, the light has to be going from a more optically dense medium to a less optically dense medium. So in other words, it should be going for something like water to air, okay, or glass to air or something. So it's a more dense medium, optically dense medium to a less optically dense medium. Then what is going to happen is that there will be an angle where the light coming through from this object, wherever that object is, will hit the boundary and then instead of being refracted, it'll actually travel along the surface of the boundary. In other words, this angle of refraction will be 90 degrees. Obviously, if this angle then gets bigger, then we'll have total internal reflection. We'll talk about that as well. So, if, there you go. If the angle of incidence is bigger than this critical angle, the refracted ray will not emerge from the medium and will be reflected back into the medium and we'll call it total internal reflection. So in other words, it would look something like this, where if the angle is bigger than the critical angle, okay, then it's going to actually cause it to be reflected back. And then obviously that angle there would equal that angle there. Okay, so, or if you wanted that angle there would equal that angle there. But the most important thing at the moment is to know that the critical angle is the angle of incidence that causes the angle of refraction to be 90 degrees. Okay, where the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So that is really the breaking point before you have total internal reflection. Okay, so it has to, like I said, be light traveling. There are conditions for the total internal reflection. It has to be that light is traveling from a more optically dense medium, which has a higher refractive index, to one of a lower optical density or a lower refractive index. The angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. Um, then you obviously have then, then you have total internal reflection. If the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, we have total internal reflection. So let's look at how you would calculate the critical angle. So we're going to be using, this is called Snell's law. Remember we spoke about it last time. Snell's law, where we said n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. n1 is the refractive index of material 1. N2 is the refractive index of material 2. Theta 1 is the angle of incidence and theta 2 is the angle of refraction. So for total internal reflection, the theta 1, which is your angle of incidence, is going to be the critical angle, right? Okay, because we need this angle to be bigger than the critical angle. So obviously we need it to, so when that happens, the theta 2 is going to be 90 degrees, okay? Therefore, we can say n1 sine theta critical angle is equal to n2 sine theta, sine of 90. So therefore, we can say that sine of theta c, in other words, critical angle, equals n2 divided by n1 multiplied by 1. Why is that 1? Because sine of 90 is 1. Think about your sine graph. Your sine, of graph, sine graph goes like this where that there is 90 degrees and the amplitude is 1. So sine of 90 is 1. 
So then sine theta C is equal to, equal to N2 divided by N1. We just divided both of these sides by N1. Multiply by one, which means that we can find the critical angle C by saying second function of the ratios of N2 over N1. So let's do a really basic example, and then we'll go back to that example that we haven't done because it had a critical angle in it. So let's see, we've got, we know that N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. And it says, given that the refractive index of air and water are 1 and 1.33, find the critical angle. Okay. So we know that it has to be going from water to air, right? Because that is one of the things that has to happen. It has to be going from a more optically dense medium to a less optically dense medium. Right, so then it's going from water to air. So here we go. And we've got the critical angle. That's going to be theta C. And then we're going to end up with the angle of refraction, which is at 90 degrees. So we know that if we look at this, that N1 is the refractive index of material 1, and N2 is the refractive index of material 2, theta 1 is the angle of incidence, and theta 2 is the angle of refraction. Okay, so in other words, N1 is going to have the refractive index of 1,33. N2 is going to have the refractive index of 1. Then theta 1 is going to be the critical angle because it's the incident angle, right? And theta 2 is going to be 90 degrees because of the fact that it is the angle of refraction. So therefore we can say, N1 sine theta C is equal to N2 sine 90. So we know the sine of 90 is 1. Okay, so we can ignore that. N1 is 1 comma 3, 3. So we've got 1 comma 3, 3. Sine of theta C is equal to N2, which is 1 multiplied by 1. So therefore, do you agree that sine of theta C, the critical angle, is 1 divided by 1 comma 3, 3. So to find theta C, we're going to say theta C is equal to second function sine of 1 over 1 comma 3, 3. And then we go shift and we find our calculator and we clear it and we make sure there's a D there so we're not actually doing this in radians and we go shift sine 1 divided by 1.33 close the bracket equals 48.75 so that is 48,75 degrees so now we know that the critical angle for this is 48,75 degrees. And remember grade 11's always round off to two decimal places. Okay, now it says, wait, oh, first, wait, first, 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 I really want to do this other question. Okay, so let's do this question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so it says, in the diagram below, not to scale, a ray of light, PO, okay, is traveling from flint glass towards the boundary with crown glass, okay? It tells you that the angle of incidence is 21 degrees. Now, if you look here, you can see that flint glass has got a higher refractive index than crown glass. So this is the more optically dense medium, and this is the less optically dense medium. So there definitely is potential here for there to be a critical angle. Now it says, the refractive indices of crown glass are 1.5 to 1.6. It says, calculate the critical angle of the two glass materials. Okay, first it said, write down Snell's law, which we did already. It's N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. Okay, so remember that N1 is the incident refractive index. So that is going to be the refractive index of material 1, which is going to be 1 comma 6, 6. Um, theta 1 is going to be the theta of the critical angle. 
N2 is a refractive index of the second piece of material, which is 1,52. And theta 2 has to be 90 degrees because that would give this to be the critical angle. So we've got 1,66 sine of theta C is going to be 1,52 sine of 90 degrees. Now grade 11s, I know that when we're working out the critical angles, this is always going to be sine of 90 degrees, okay? But you can't just ignore that and just write 1 or just write 1.52 because then you haven't shown you're working and they're going to wonder if you really knew what you're doing or you're just doing it by rote. So you need to write that sine 90 so that they can see that you actually knew that sine 90 was supposed to be here because that's how you get this critical angle. So therefore you've got sine of theta c is going to be, this is obviously equal to 1. So it's 1 comma 5 to all over 1 comma 6, 6. Therefore, theta c is going to be second function sine of 1 comma 5 to over 1 comma 6, 6. There you go. And now we need our calculator. So let's get out our calculator. So we're going to say shift sine of 1.52 divided by 1.66. Close bracket equals 66.3. So in this case, the critical angle is 66.3 degrees. Okay, so there we've done it. Now it says copy the diagram. Obviously, we're not. On your diagram, draw a ray to show what happens to light ray PO at the boundary between the two glasses. Label the ray OX. Well, obviously, if PO PO is only 21 degrees, right? So it is seriously not the critical angle, okay? So the critical angle is 66.3. So now let's think about this. Do you agree that it's going from a more optical dense medium, more optical dense, to a less optically dense medium, to a less optically dense medium? So do you think this is going to speed up or slow down? Okay, is it going to speed up or slow down? Do you agree the light is going to speed up? It's going to speed up as it gets into this new medium from this flint glass to the crown glass. So now what you've got to do is think about the fact that it's obviously going to bend and we need to work out if it's going to bend towards the normal or away from the normal. So what I want you to, I just want to write this down over here, 66,3 degrees. What I want you to remember is what we spoke about last time, which was about the track hitting the sand patch, okay? So if you recall, we spoke about the fact that if you had a hard road, okay, and you had a track that was going off the road. And this is the road, and this is the sand, okay? So what's gonna happen is as the track is going off, okay, so this is basically your incident array, okay, and it goes off, then what happens? This wheel gets stuck in the sand, and it causes this whole track to go around that point. And if this is the normal, it goes towards the normal, okay? So it tends to turn around and go towards the normal, okay? So then obviously, if we go in the other way, you can see that it goes away from the normal, okay? It goes away from the normal. This is where it would be if it was just, it would just be like this. Oh, this is very bad drawing. Hang on a minute, let me try again. This would be the incident ray if it was going from hard to soft, in other words, less to more, it'll be going towards the normal, okay? Now, if we're going this way, which is what this direction is going, it's going from the sand to the road, so it's going to go away from the normal. So if this was going like this, we need to go away from the normal, so it would be something like that. And all you're trying to show is that that angle there is bigger than the 21 degrees. And we label it OX. Now it says, OQ is incident at the boundary of as 40 degrees. So the whole of this is 40 degrees. Okay. Now it says draw a ray to show what happens to light ray OQ at the boundary between the two glasses. Label this ray OY. Okay. And indicate the angle. 
<sighs> that's just the same thing. That's just silly. We're not going to worry with that. That's going to also just be further down. Okay, it's because it's going to get closer and closer to the critical angle. So it's going to be, okay, so maybe I can just show you a bit better. Yeah, hang on. This 21 degrees was not really 21 degrees. So let me just try again. So if it had to bend away from the normal, it would be something like that. Okay. And then that would be X. And then since this angle is 40 degrees and it's getting closer and closer to the critical angle, it's now going to bend even closer towards the 90 degrees. And that's going to be Y. Okay, so it's include the angle NOY in your drawing. NOY. NOI. There you go. Now it says, how does the speed of light in the crown glass compared to that of the flint glass? Write down only greater than, less than, or equal to. Well, we've already explained that since that this is obviously less, obviously dense, then this, this is obviously speeding up. So the answer is greater than. Hmm. Okay. All right. Let's go back to this one now and let's try this question. So I've done a whole bunch of questions. You'll see this one, two, three, and then we're moving on. And all of these are all exam paper questions, either looking at Snell's law or looking at um, critical angles or both. Okay. And it says, and these are like I said, all old exam paper questions. Okay, so it says learners use a rectangular glass block to verify Snell's law in the school lab. The six steps followed are given below, but not in the correct sequence. Okay, and they love asking questions like this. They really do. So we need to work through it. It says, place the rectangular glass block on a sheet of white paper. Shine a single narrow ray of light onto, from a ray box onto one of the long faces of the glass box. Mark the ray incident on the glass block and the ray emerging from it. Draw an outline of the glass block. Vary the angle of incidence so that you can take a number of different pairs of readings. Measure the angle of incidence and the corresponding angle thing. Okay, so obviously those are in the wrong order and we'll talk about that now. Now it says state sounds law in words and like I've told you, there's no real words. It's N1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. Now it says arrange the steps numbered 1 to 6 in the correct sequence. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to draw an outline. Um, okay, the first thing we are going to do is place the rectangular glass block on the sheet of paper. Next, number two, is we're going to draw the outline of the glass block. Okay. Number three is we're going to shine a narrow ray of light from a ray box onto one of the long faces of the glass box. Four, we're going to mark the ray incident on the glass block and the ray emerging from it. Then Five is we're going to measure the angle of incidence and the corresponding angle of refraction. And then six, we're going to vary the angle of incidence so we can take different pairs of readings. So let me explain what we're doing. We're going to take a piece of paper, okay? And we're going to place our glass block on it today. This is from the top, okay? Oh, okay, let me just, this is from the top. So we're going to take it and we're going to place our glass block there. Right, that's what we've done, one. Then we're going to draw an outline on the glass block. Okay, there's a reason for it. We're going to now draw the outline. So let's use blue and we're going to draw the outline. Okay, remember we're looking at this from the top. Then what we are going to do is we're going to shine a single ray of light from a ray box onto one of the face of the glass blocks. So we're going to shine a light. Here's the ray box. Okay, and we're shining a light onto it. Okay. Next, what we're going to do is they say we must, it says mark the ray incident on the glass block. Okay, so we're going to mark it and the ray emerging from it. So we should have something that looks like this and then looks like that. Okay. So then what we're going to do is mark that as well. Okay. Then we're going to measure the angle of incidence and the corresponding angle of refraction. So we're going to measure the angles and then we do this over and over and over again. So what will end up giving us is a whole bunch of angles of incidence and angles of refraction. 
Easy peasy, okay? So this is why we have to get in the right order, okay? So let's give a reason why it's necessary to draw in the outline of the glass box because in order to measure the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction, okay, we actually need, sorry, let me try again, the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction, we actually need to move the glass block. So if we had, didn't have the outline of the glass block, we wouldn't be able to measure it. So let me just make that bigger so you can understand what I'm talking about. Okay, pretend this is the top of the glass block, what I'm about to draw, okay? This is the glass block, okay? Now, what's happening is there's going to be light coming in at an angle. Okay, there's your normal. And then the right light gets refracted towards the normal. Okay. And then there's the normal and then it gets refracted out again. Okay. And obviously those two should be parallel to each other. But what we're going to do is we're going to measure this angle here and we're going to measure this angle here. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw the block, outline of the block on the piece of paper, right? Then what we're going to do is we're going to use, when the light is shining on it, we're going to draw this line and we're going to draw this line, okay? Then we're going to move the glass block so it's gone, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to join these dots. And because we're joining these dots, we will now be able to work out that angle there because we have obviously got the surface, the, the outline of the glass block. So we can work out that angle there, which is the angle of incidence. We now also have that angle there because we've joined these two, which is the angle of refraction. And there you go. And then obviously we need to do this a couple of times to get a whole bunch of different corresponding angles of refraction and incidence. Okay, so why did you have to draw the outline of the glass block? Because we're gonna have to move it in order to measure those actual angles. Now it says, now it says, the graph below, which is next to us, shows the results obtained during the experiment. So if we look at the graph, do you see it's a graph of sine theta versus sine r? Sine theta versus sine r. So if you look at that, do you agree it's n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. So sine theta sine i, which is the incident angle, is on the y-axis and sine r is on the x-axis. So if I had to rearrange this, do you agree it would be sine theta 1, or the incident, over sine theta 2 is equal to n2 divided by n1. n2 divided by n1. Okay, now the next thing they say is calculate the slope or the gradient of the graph. Okay, well that's fairly easy. We can just choose some points. Um, so I'm going to choose that point there because it looks quite easy to read and it really doesn't matter. And we can talk, choose zero. Do you agree? So that point there, the x value is this one here. So I'm going to go down. And guys, don't be scared to do this in the exams. And obviously in the exams, you're going to get a bigger version of this graph, which will make it a bit easier. So this is 0.4 and this is 0.6. So each of these must be worth 0.02. So it's 0.4, 2, 0.4, 4, 0.4, 6, 0.4, 8, 0 0.5, 0 0.52, 0 0.54. So the x value, the x is 0 0.54. And the y is 0, 8. And obviously that point there is 0. So therefore we can say m is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I'm going to call this point 2 and this point 1. So therefore we're going to go y2 is 0, 8 minus 0 over x2 is 0, 0,54 minus 0. So if I pop that in my calculator, I get 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.54 equals 40 divided by 27 or 1.48. 
Okay, so you can either write it as 1, 4, 840 over 27 or 1, 48. And it says, what does the slope represent? Well, the slope actually represents the difference in the refractive indices between the um, angle of refraction. It's basically, it's basically a ratio of the refractive indices of the second material to the first material. There you go. That's what it is. Right. Now, next question. Okay, so let's do this. It says, the angle of incidence of the light at the glass air interface, this glass air interface is now increased to 50 degrees. Okay, the critical angle is 46 degrees. Define the term critical angle. So critical angle, remember, is the incident angle at which the refracted, the angle of refraction, angle of refraction equals 90 degrees. Okay. Please, guys, when you write out the definition, do not write it like that. You will write it using proper words. Okay. Now it says, name the phenomenon that will now be observed at the glass air interface, and it would be obviously be total internal reflection total internal reflection and it says name one obstacle instrument instrument that can be used to make use of this phenomenon let's think about this it could be a periscope okay do you remember what a periscope looks like i mean basically if you're in a submarine and you want to look up onto the spit onto the and the submarines below the surface and you want to look to see what's going on you use a periscope and the way a periscope works is this You've got basically a tube and a tube, and then you have another tube and a tube and a tube, and you have a mirror or a prism. We'll just pretend it's a mirror for now. And you have a mirror here. And these angles are 45 degrees. Okay. So what happens is the light comes, or it could be a prism, okay? The light comes in is reflected down, reflected back, and then we get to see it. There's our big eye. Okay, so that there is how a um, prism works. And just let me show you what the rest of the prism would look like. It would look like this. So this would be a right angled prism. The light would go straight into that. It wouldn't refract because it's hitting it at 90 degrees. Similarly, over here, the prism is going to look like that. Light does not refract because it's hitting that surface at 90 degrees. Because it's hitting at the angle of incidence is a critical angle. I mean, past the critical angle, it's going to total internal reflection and it's going to kick back. And there you go. Okay, so that is an example of an optical instrument that can be used for this phenomena, and that would be a periscope. Binoculars can work the same way. But instead of it being sent uh, over a 90 degree period, it actually gets sent back a couple of times, but don't worry about that too much. Okay, next question. The last question before we start on uh, 2D waves and 3D waves. Okay, a diamond glitters in light because it has a high refractive index of 2,42 and the, the small critical angle of the diamond air boundary. The first thing they say is calculate the critical air, a critical angle of the diamond air interface, and it says take the refractive infraction index of air to be one. So you can see that we have to go from when we're doing critical angle from diamond to air. Remember, we're going to go we're going from the diamond to the air. So we've got n1 sine theta one is equal to n2 sine theta two. So again, N1 is going to be the high refractive index of 2,42. Sine of your theta C, your critical angle, is equal to N2, which in this case is 1. And then this is sine of 90. So therefore, sine of theta C is equal to 1 divided by 2,42. So therefore, theta C is equal to going to be second function sine of 1 divided by 2,42. That's a comma. Okay, so we need a calculator. 
So we go shift sine one divided by 2.42 close bracket equals 24.41. So the theta, the critical angle is 24 comma 41 degrees, which isn't a huge angle. So therefore you can see it's actually quite easy for it, the angle to hit um, the light to be hitting at the critical angle. Now it says angle of incidence of light at the diamond air interface is increased to 30 degrees. Redraw the diagram and complete the path um, right. So, okay, so do you agree that this light is going to be coming in at exactly 90 degrees? So, therefore, it is not refracted here, okay? But then what happens is it goes straight down. We okay. And now it hits over here. But what happens when it hits over there? It is going to be total internal reflection because this angle is bigger than the critical angle. So then we go, we okay. And then what's going to happen again, this angle is possibly bigger than the angle of incidence of 30 degrees. Um, and then you might end up having it be reflected back out. Okay, and it might only go out back out there again. Okay, so you can see that light gets refracted and reflected the whole way through. It says name the phenomena that will now be observed at the diamond air interface, and that will be total internal reflection. It says what two conditions that are necessary for this phenomena? One is that the light is moving from a higher, or sorry, from a more optically dense medium. Remember, we spoke about this dense medium to a lower one. And what's the other one? Let's think about it. Remember, I taught it to you. It is that the angle of incidence has to be greater than the critical angle. That the angle of incidence, angle of incidence has to be greater than the, let's put it this way, theta i has to be greater than theta c. Otherwise, obviously you don't get the total internal reflection. It says, name the medical instrument used to examine internal parts of the body that make use of the phenomena in question 9.3. Okay, so there are a couple of medical instruments, but one that is very often used is called an endoscope, an endoscope. And an endoscope works very much like glass fibers. What happens is, um, let me show you, okay, let's draw it black. You would have a tube, okay, and it's made of specific amount of, a specific type of material that when the light shines on it at the right angle, it is going to cause total internal reflection, which means it goes down here and down here and down here and like that. And eventually what will happen is it will get to what you're looking at. Okay, so, and then it will reflect what's happened and then that light will travel back to your eye. Okay, so that is what an endoscope is. It's, it's basically a long thin tube that they either, generally you can either go down your throat or you have to unfortunately take it up the bum um, and then use it to look at what's going on in your body. But usually it's taken down your throat, which is horrible. Right, let's talk about diffraction and Huygens principle. Okay, so Huygens came up with the principle of how diffraction works. Now, first of all, you need to remember that diffraction means that it's the bending of light, okay? So, in order to explain how waves bend around corners and how waves, why waves behave the way they do, Huygens came up with a principle and he said that basically a wave front is not just a straight line of material. He says every wave front is made up of a point, which is a source of secondary waves. Okay, I'll draw this for you now. The new wave front is then 
made up of its tangential surface to all the secondary wavelets and all the points in the new wavefront are in phase. Okay, so let me show you this quickly um, and you can see what I'm talking about. So what you've got is what we call wavefronts, okay? So at the moment, this is what we think light travels. So light is traveling this way and these front wavefronts, okay? The bright ones are the crests, okay? So you can see the wave is now there's a crest moving along, moving along, moving along. Okay, right. But now, so this is the trough and these are the crest, okay? So now he's saying that every point, and obviously we're not drawing every single point because then we wouldn't be able to show you this. So he's saying that every point on the wavefront acts as a point source for a wave. In other words, right? So this is going to cause a wave to form. This is going to cause a wave to form. This is a point source and this is a point source. But what do point sources do? They cause waves to travel out to 360 degrees. So you've got circles, right? But now what happens is there is overlapping of these circles. Okay, wait, 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 there we go. Oh, I hate it when it does that. I don't actually understand what's wrong with the study software. Sorry, that it does this. Okay, right, so let's just play it. Okay, right, so now what happens is, okay, so what happens is it's going to, I can't draw it on you, unfortunately. Yeah, okay, right. So what's going to happen is it's going to, all these waves, I wonder if I can. Oh, I can. Okay, so what's going to happen is these waves, and I'll show it to you now, they actually overlap, right? They overlap. I know my drawing's terrible. But they will get to a point where they will overlap and there will only be a small gap between these wave fronts that are overlapping okay and that there will cause a new wave front and that is a new wave front that moves over and then again uh hang on then again this every point on here is going to act like a new point source and it's going to cause waves to go around but obviously we only draw the front bits because we don't care about the back bits why don't we care about the backwards because they get cancelled by the forward moving ones okay so then what happens is again we're going to get wave fronts that are formed okay so every time is the every point but remember now this is every single point on the surface so if i had to erase all the ink and try again if I had another point here and another point here and another point there, okay, so this has got wave fronts, right? But this suit also has got wave fronts coming from it. And this dude also has got, well, that's the first one already, wave fronts coming from it. Do you see it's forming? Okay, I've got a really bad drawing, but it's forming a solid front. And that's what's causing the fret the solid wave front that's what causes what looks like a solid wave front to us so now if i raise all my ink again and let's draw what oh, breathe candace okay right and then we watch it you can see i'm going to start over here okay you can see that the wave fronts are now being generated Okay, and they get bigger and bigger, and here's a second one forming because of point source. Okay, but at this point here, they're going to get to a point where they overlap so much so that they form a new barrier line. Okay, so that there is what's going to happen. It actually is a new barrier line that's being formed, and every single one of these starts is a new point source. Okay, so that is your new wave front that is being formed it's not a barrier line wave front that's being formed why does it want to do this stupid okay so there you go there is your new wave that is formed okay all right so and obviously it goes backwards as well but the thing is that this one is coming forwards so the backward ones cancel with forward ones so you don't have to worry about them Okay, so that is how Huygens said that he thought that waves were formed. He said that every point on a wavefront is a source of secondary wavelets. So every point on the wavefront is a source of secondary wavelets. And the new wavefront is a tangential surface. Okay, so in other words, the new wavefront is a tangent. It's basically if we draw a line, a tangent to all the fronts of these circles, then we will get the new wavefront. And all the points in the new wavefront are in phase. Okay, makes sense, right? So that was Huygens' principle. So the definition you have to learn, NB, you have to learn this definition, okay? 
Every point of a wavefront serves as a point source of spherical secondary waves. After a time t, the new position of the wavefront will be that of the surface tangent to the secondary waves. So like we said, wavefront, then they overlap and we get a new surface which is tangential. It's a tangent to all the overlapping surfaces of the round wavefronts to give you a new wavefront. Okay, right, so we will carry on with diffraction in the next lesson over here. So this will be where we start here on the diffraction and how Huygens principle explains diffraction. Right, I hope you have a great day, grade 12s, uh, I mean grade 11s, and I will chat to you on Thursday. Cheers.